Okay, thank you, Meryl. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Bill Toon is an internationally recognized conservation biologist. In addition to his early work with the California condor, and Bill was instrumental with the San Diego Zoological Society in preserving the California cond condor several years back, he has led biological transects and expeditions through the rainforests of Madagascar, Papua New Guinea, Paraguay, and others. And about four, four years ago, Bill did a presentation um, in, uh, for us in, uh, about his experiences in Madagascar. It was absolutely riveting. I think anyone who went to it, it, it's just, it stayed with me for the four years. Bill is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Yeah winner of the 2023 AARP Purpose Prize and founder of EcoLife Conservation, a unique conservation humanitarian nonprofit. Maybe we'll hear a little, about, a little bit about that tonight. Bill and his wife, Sunny, live in Escondido, where they enjoy food, gardening, gardening crafts, woodworking, and some lovely pets. Bill, over to you. Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, give me just a moment while we get my screen set up and uh, see if I can get all this to work correctly for us. There, does everyone see um, a title sheet and some butterflies? Good. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you today. Uh, about monarch butterflies, but my although I will touch on the Western population, our story tonight is really going to be very much about the Eastern population of monarch butterflies and the magnificent journey that they make. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I did. I started my career with the California Condor Recovery Program, and I, I was the person, along with Dr. Noel Snyder, to bring in the very first California condor egg. And at that time, I had only known condors as a wild bird. And it was emotional for me to be part of bringing a chicken, an egg into captivity that um, would likely produce a bird that would spend the rest of its life in a cage. And I promised myself I'd stay in the program till we released a bird to the wild. And I did that, and I we in uh, 1993 when the first birds were released to the wild, I resigned from the recovery team, which emboldened me enough to end up getting in a fight with the Secretary of Interior over what we were doing, and I soon found myself studying old growth logging in Papua New Guinea. It turns out that the uh, headhunters of Papua New Guinea are a little bit easier to work with than uh, our own federal government at times kidding. <laughs> uh, from there, I went in search of the next exciting condor pro or next exciting conservation program. Um, I did some film work with Olivia Newton-John in Costa Rica, uh, doing some butterfly stories there. But it really was uh, the experience in Madagascar that I shared the last time and meeting this lovely woman that aimed my career in a new direction that included the monarch butterfly um, over the last three decades. This is my wife, Sunny. Um, I was trying to get a date with her and not doing very well. And uh, we were both bird people, but she went off on a holiday. And when she came back, uh, she told me she'd fallen in love with butterflies after an experience uh, in Australia. And so I set about opening the first butterfly exhibit in the United States, the Hidden Jungle at the San Diego Wild Animal Park, and in so doing, won her heart and won for myself a fascination with monarch butterflies. Bill, I'm so that, sorry to yeah. the inter another interruption here, but um, your slideshow isn't actually progressing. It's just ah. it's showing your Mac keynote screen, screen if you want to take a moment and correct that. All right, I'm not sure how to correct that. Let's see, try playing it this way. Now, do you see a condor? No, we're still on the first slide. Mm, wonder why that is. Um, let me. Um, now, condor, condor is now. 
Yeah, but you see all the rest of my screen slides. Exactly. Let me try. There you go. Okay, Beautiful. and if I if I move, is this Papua New Guinea? You're in. Okay. Well, there's the headhunters I was talking about. Sorry, <laughs> and um, my my filming work with Olivia Newton John and um, the lovely woman I was talking about, my wife Sunny, who caused me to really fall in love with butterflies. <clears throat> So I'm going to start off by giving you some basic life history of the monarch butterfly. And um, these are pictures of tropical milkweed that you're seeing on your screen. Um, monarch butterflies larvae feed exclusively on the leaves of milkweed plants. There's a, there are dozens of species of milkweed in the United States. But the one thing that all of these milkweeds have in common is that they produce a cardiac glycoside. And this cardiac glycoside is toxic. Uh, if you're an old rancher, old time rancher, or even a new time rancher, uh, if you've had cattle or horses out on the fields during a drought, um, you might have run into problems with loco weed. Um, basically, what we're talking about is milkweed. So these cardiac glycosides can make animals quite sick, um, they can make them act crazy. And it works very well for protecting the monarch butterflies. One of the really fascinating things about their feeding on milkweed, there's a lot of debate right now about which milkweeds we should be using. And to be on the safe side, I always tell people, use your local native milkweeds if you're going to feed monarch butterflies. Here's a funny fact, though. Monarch butterflies are amongst a group of butterflies that do what they call self-medication they actually will select milkweed plants with higher levels of toxin to give themselves higher level of protection. So if you plant native milkweeds in your yard and someone within a couple of miles of you has tropical milkweed in their yards, you're gonna have some problems with your butterflies going to their house because of the higher level of cardiac glycosides. Hmm. But it is these plants that the butterflies are determined to lay their eggs on. And with that, I want to take you through the butterfly life cycle really quickly. Now, I know that going through elementary school, grade school, we all were taught about the stages of an insect's life. But I have to tell you, I took a lovely couple to Mexico to see the overwintering phenomena. He was a very well-educated man, an attorney. And I had told him months before we left that if they planted milkweed around their home, that the monarch butterflies would come. And in fact, that happened. But at our farewell dinner from our expedition, uh, he stood up to the group and he said, I, I have a confession I have to make. Uh, Bill Toon told me to plant milkweed. I did that. And sure enough, the air was filled with these flying flowers. These monarch butterflies came from everywhere and into my garden. But he said, then I had to go in the house and get my scissors and cut up all these caterpillars that were eating the plants not understanding that the caterpillars were the offspring of the monarch <laughs> butterfly. So let me walk you through this um, so that we really know what's happening. This is the egg of a monarch butterfly. It's just about the size of a head of a pin. It takes only a few days for this larva to develop and then emerge from the egg. Now you're going to hear me say emerge. Now I'm a bird biologist by training. <laughs> Excuse me. And we always talk about birds hatching. Birds hatch. Caterpillars do not. Caterpillars eat their way out of an egg, whereas a bird breaks its way out of an egg. A caterpillar, in general, is little more than a mouth, a gut, and an anus. And they start right off feeding themselves by chewing a hole through their egg. And he'll turn right back around and feed on that egg as eggshell as his first meal. And then it will be on to feeding on milkweed. Now, this little guy is going to grow very rapidly um, over the next week or two. He's going to increase his weight by over a thousand fold from this tiny little larva to a much larger one. They will go through, it's an insect, so they have an exoskeleton. In order for this caterpillar to grow, it has to shed its skin. So it's going to go through five instars shedding its skin until it's ready to pupate. Now, I guarantee you that most of you out in the audience at some point 
site, a fuzzy wuzzy caterpillar or some other caterpillar walking across the sidewalk near your home or the grocery store or whatever. And because you're kind hearted people, you pick that little larva up and you set it back on a plant. Well, that was just frustrating to the caterpillar because it was leaving on purpose. Predators come to know that there will be larva on these plants that serve as host plants. And so the final stage of the caterpillar is called a wandering stage. And it leaves the milkweed plant, wanders away down your sidewalk to a wall or another plant where predators will not suspect that it's there. And it's there that it will form what we call a J. That J is a, a little silk pad that they attach to something, they hook to it, shed their skin for the last time and form the beautiful monarch butterfly chrysalis. Now, before we go too far, chrysalis is derived from the Greek. Um, it means gold or silver, heavy metals. And almost every chrysalis of a butterfly has some shiny spots of either gold or silver on it. And the monarch chrysalis <laughs> is no exception. Um, one little point to keep in mind is a lot of people refer to these as cocoons. This is not a cocoon, it is a chrysalis or a pupa. Moths create cocoons. Cocoons are actually the silk, or sometimes it can be done with sticks and debris stuck to silk that's wrapped around a chrysalis or a pupa, and it's most commonly done by moths. But this little item right here is a chrysalis and not a cocoon. Shortly after this hangs, magic happens inside. Um, genes that have been asleep during the caterpillar's life come awake. Um, they reorganize all of the cells and liquids inside of the chrysalis, and we have this amazing emergence of the monarch butterfly. very much want to thank uh, Lynn Splain in the Ecolife Conservation Offices for the videos that helped us to illustrate the life cycle of the monarch butterfly from egg to larva to chrysalis to the adult butterfly. <clears throat> now, uh, for this presentation about the eastern monarch butterfly, I have to introduce Fred and Nora Urquhart. Fred was a, uh, is a was a Canadian. He's passed away a while now. Um, but Fred, as a small child, used to collect butterflies like many of us, and he'd put pins through them and stick them to cardboard. He became fascinated that the monarch butterfly seemed to show up late in the, well, mid middle of summer and disappeared in the late summer and wasn't around the rest of the year. And as a small child, that fascinated him as he ran around chasing butterflies. He chased them around as he got older to find out where they were going, and he was able to follow them to the Canadian-US border where he lost them late in the summer. Fred went on to get a degree in entomology and dedicated his life to making one of the most remarkable natural history discoveries of the 20th century. And I wanna tell his story here very briefly. Fred knew that if he wanted to find out where these butterflies were going, he had to develop a way of following them. Now, as a bird biologist, and especially as a condor biologist, 
I have an unfair advantage. I want to leap right to putting a wing tag on them that's got batteries in it and solar panels and an antenna so that we can track our birds for miles and miles. Unfortunately, you put one of those onto a butterfly, you won't even be able to find the butterfly. So Fred was a little wiser than all that. And he said about finding out how he could put a lightweight tape tag on the butterflies. And he experimented with all sorts of glues and things and finally settled on the same kind of glue that they used to put price tags on grocery store items. Basically, uh, what they do now, this is an older picture. They, they tag monarch butterflies now on the hind wing. In the early years when I got started in the monarch butterfly program, we tagged them on the fore wing. Now the cells on a butterfly's, the scales on a butterfly's wing are really designed to protect them from predators and they come off quite easily. So if you stick a tag onto their wing with all those scales on there, like a bird's beak, it'll slip off and the butterfly will get away from that tag. So we would always rub a clear spot, called it a window, taking all the scales off. And then that little tag that you see on my finger would get stuck on the wing. On that tag, there's very minimal information, but there's a phone number to call and, it's, and a unique serial number that matches that tag. While we have the butterflies in hand to do this, we collect a bit of data about them. Uh, we try to estimate their age based on how torn their wings are or how worn they look. Uh, we estimate their size. We determine their sex. And uh, I hear they're not doing this anymore, but we used to palpate the female's abdomen, feeling for um, little sperm BBs so that we could tell if the female had mated or not. Um, mating in nature is very competitive. Um, in the butterfly, the male puts in a sperm packet that actually blocks her oviduct. Um, other sperm packets back up behind it. And it's not until the first one dissolves that the next guy in line gets a shot at fertilizing the butterfly. Fred released these butterflies and um, knew quit, figured out very quickly that even if he could tag a couple thousand of them a week, the chances of getting a return on his, his butterflies were very, very slim and getting an accurate returns. So he would need multiple returns. You can imagine a butterfly with a tag on it that gets hit by a Mack truck carried several thousand miles, and then someone finds the tag and calls it in. So you need a lot of data points so that you can rule out those accidental data points. Fred realized early on that this was going to be a huge task. When he came into the U.S. in the midst of the 60s, and he went around to hippie communes and community clubs, and he created a, a band of community biologists, community scientists, he trained people all over to tag millions upon millions of monarch butterflies. And he was very successful at doing this and was able then to track monarch butterflies all the way from the Canadian border, Canadian U.S. border, to the U.S.-Mexican border, where once again, he lost them. His wife, Nora, stepped in at this point to help him and did a radio show in Mexico um, asking people to send any kind of information they might have had about butterflies to them. This picture is really quite remarkable. When Fred and Nora got a call from a man by the name of Kenneth Brueger, um, they were quite surprised. Kenneth Brueger was in Mexico training people to work in factories. He was actually um, working in an underwear factory, and his specialty had something to do with putting the elastic into underwear. But while he was working in Mexico, he fell in love with an indigenous woman by the name of Catalina. Catalina was Purépecha. Her, her tribe of indigenous people were the Purépecha people. And she had described to Kenneth how on Day of the Dead, the lost spirits came back to their communities in the form of butterflies. So Fred and Nora, thinking these might be their butterflies, headed off to Mexico. Now, this was against... <clears throat> Fred's doctor's better judgment. Fred had a heart condition at this point. These monarch butterflies were reported to be at 10,000 feet. And uh, so he, he, while he was told not to go, um, being every bit the dedicated scientist, he pressed on. When they got up into the mountains, what Fred discovered 
was beyond anything anyone had imagined. The estimate is, is that there were roughly 1 billion butterflies. Um, billion's a big number. I'll try to make it into a slightly smaller number. And I hang on to this number. This is just amazing. This was 550 tons of monarch butterflies in these forests in central Mexico. The mountain that he was on was Cerro Pelon. And there, with a National Geographic photographer there to document the moment, Fred, tired and panting, sat down on a st tree stump in the midst of tens of thousands of butterflies. And his comment to people was that, how did he know that these were his butterflies? He had no way of being sure. He was every bit the scientist. And I want you to imagine the odds that were against him here when you think about how many butterflies were tagged and the fact that there's a billion butterflies in these forests. Fred sat down on a stump and with his walking stick, he stirred the pile of dead butterflies at his feet and bent over and picked up this butterfly bearing one of his tags. His mm -hmm. search for the monarch butterflies was finally over in the mountains of Michoacan, just north of Mexico City. Now, you might think, too, that if there's over a billion butterflies there, 550 tons of butterflies, why hadn't anyone heard about this? And this was a question that Fred asked the local communities, and the response was perfect. Doesn't this happen everywhere? These are people who don't travel a lot. They're, they're very poor indigenous people now living on a Hito land in these communities. None of them traveled. It happened every year there. They had no reason to believe that this phenomena did not happen anywhere or everywhere. Now, here's Catalina on the cover of National Geographic. With that discovery, the overwintering sites of the monarch butterfly were revealed to the world and have created a tourist phenomena, a natural history tourist phenomena that has been very beneficial to the economy of Mexico, the state of Michoacan, and the local people. As Catalina had said, the monarch butterflies arrive in Mexico on or around Day of the Dead. Now, as a biologist, I travel around chasing migrations. I have just returned from East Africa, where I watched the wildebeest and zebra herds crossing the Mara River and dodging the mouths of crocodiles. I try to catch that every year, but it's difficult because those animals are moving based on weather. And as we all know, weather is changing a great deal. And so the rains can shift and the green grasses can shift and the timing of that migration can shift. The monarch butterfly is not migrating that way. It's migrating on day length. And so its habits are very predictable. We know that on day of the dead, we will start to find butterflies. And for the people of the mountains of Michoacan, uh, the butterflies have become very much a part of their Day of the Dead celebrations. This is a young Purepecha woman. Uh, you can see the monarch butterflies in her crown of marigolds. And of course, also her face has been decorated uh, with the wings of the monarch butterfly. So, Although the Day of the Dead tradition is one that spread throughout Latin America and has gained great fame now thanks to the movie Coco and has taken on many colors, to this day in the mountains of Michoacan, it is very much about the monarch butterflies. Now, of course, the monarch butterflies don't all arrive at the same time. They, they arrive pretty close, trickling in. What starts is a little whisper of butterflies coming through the trees slowly turns into a little creek, and that creek turns into a river. That river gradually turns into a highway of monarch butterflies arriving into the mountains there. Many of these butterflies have flown from as far away as Canada. All of these butterflies have come somewhere east, from somewhere east of the Rockies, and all are aiming towards the same place, the same mountain range in Mexico. When they arrive, their behavior will be a little bit um, disorganized. You'll find them on many kinds of bushes and trees trailing around. But as winter approaches and it gets cooler, the butterflies start to coalesce onto one tree 
and only one type of tree, and that is the OML fir tree. They come in huge numbers, obviously. These huge trees have stood in the summer sun all through that summer and absorbed heat to their core. I'm certain that the heat in these trees plays some role in keeping the butterflies warm for the first part of, of their winter months. Um, they leave the other trees in the area getting thicker and thicker and thicker on these OML firs until that's all you can see on the tree is butterflies. Now, if you arrive there in December, or early January, um, I find it not too exciting to see. I mean, it's pretty amazing to go in underneath a tree that's covered from one end to the other. But in the forest, the tree just looks dark and, and lifeless. Um, but it's as we get closer to the springtime that the real action begins. Now, they're going to leave this forest by early, sometime in early March. But before they go, they've spent a winter there where they've been very cold, they've gotten very dehydrated and very hungry. And as the weather begins to warm and flowers begin to blossom, the butterflies will leave the trees in search of water and nectar for energy. Now, I don't know what causes it, but there's, I mean, we know temperature triggers them to start to fly, but it's as though every butterfly in the tree is anchored to another. And they come out in these floods of butterflies that I like to call simply a drop. And you can hear it begin to happen. And they just flood the air. For Sunny and I, my wife in this picture, this has become the annual heartbeat of our love life to go to Mexico every year and celebrate these monarch butterflies leaving the trees in search of water and nectar. I'm not very good around water. I grew up in San Diego, right near the coast. Um, I don't surf. I don't like to swim. I sink. One of the reasons I don't like it is, of course, because our water is very cold. And because I'm not real familiar with water, when I try to snorkel, there's a moment where when I put my face in the water, I feel I can't breathe, even with the mask and snorkel on. And it takes a minute to, to get my breath and breathe in. There are times walking down the pathways in the monarch butterfly forest where I have that same phenomena. So many butterflies coming towards my face that I'm afraid to inhale for fear that I will inhale one of these flying flowers of the OML forest. They can literally fill the air around you. People ask me if I don't get tired going to these places year after year. Um, the answer is no, I don't, not at all. I could never see enough of this absolute magic of these butterflies in the springtime as they regain their energy. Now, I was watching in the chat, we have some lovely butterfly biologists that have joined us, and, and I'm very honored that you all are here. Um, it's a, a real challenge for these butterflies the OML fir forest and I'm sorry I mentioned the biologist and I forgot what I was going to tell you all about that but let me go to the this is a picture of the OML fir forest this is core to the survival of this overwintering population of monarch butterflies the forest of these mountains is important to people as well this is the watershed for one of the largest cities in the world Mexico City on the other side of the mountains, it's the watership for large industrial cities like Toluca and Sitacuro. And of course, these forests themselves are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a biosphere reserve, um, something that has been determined because of the monarch butterflies going there to be of value to all the people of the world. It's a really profound thing to be a, a natural UNESCO World Heritage Site. But these forests are in trouble. And along with them, so are the monarch butterflies. This is a picture taken in 2000, and I'd already had a pretty bad year. For those of you who heard my Madagascar presentation, you knew of a little boy that I'd fallen in love with and worked with at him at my side for about four years in Madagascar. Very early in 2000, there was a huge storm off the coast of Madagascar and his community was destroyed. And it was 16 years before I was able to find him again and renew a relationship. But it was only right after that loss when as far as I knew he was dead 
that I went to visit the monarch butterflies in Mexico. When I approached El Rosario, which is the most famous and largest of the monarch butterfly reserves in the region, uh, the sign to El Rosario had been blacked out, ironically, by charcoal and read El Cementario. Literally in one night, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of monarch butterflies had been killed in a cold storm that swept through. Now, yes, this was a big storm, bigger than usual, but these butterflies and these trees have had this relationship for thousands of years and have managed to push through it without all of these disasters. So what's going on with these trees? Now, as a climate group, you're going to have some other opinions, and you're probably right, and we're going to talk about some of those. Um, but there's some, some big threats here. In the case of this, what had happened is these forests over time were being thinned both by illegal logging, the removal of entire trees um, for, for illegal lumber and, and paper making and that sort of thing, um, but also uh, the communities, the indigenous communities that live around these trees remove hundreds of thousands of trees every year to cook and stay warm. Removing trees and branches from these forests is, is this exact same thing as punching holes in your blanket on your bed. You punch enough holes and eventually your blanket can't keep you warm. And this is what was happening in Mexico. Now, this is really critical. Don't get me wrong. There are tens of thousands of threats to the monarch butterfly. Any animal that's making a migration, certainly across the United States, is going to run into all sorts of problems. One that's a nectar feeder that's going to flowers, crossing our crops that are being sprayed, GMO crops that will tolerate higher levels of spraying and broader spraying than any other crops. So they're going through hurdle after hurdle to get to Mexico. But the one thing about these forests that makes them critical is just this phenomena that you see on your screen. When you have that much of one population in one place, they're at great jeopardy uh, when these trees are damaged. As I mentioned, uh, some of these trees are cut by illegal loggers. Um, there's logging cartels in the region. Um, they're powerful, and I personally have chosen not to uh, interface with them. Now, there was recently a president in, in Mexico who took on all of the cartels, got them pretty angry. The drug cartels went into the monarch butterfly forest and wouldn't let anyone else in. And during that year, illegal logging dropped by about 97%. Uh, things have loosened up a little bit since the drug cartels are back in their place. Uh, nonetheless, there's a fair bit of logging, and there is work being done to reduce it. Um, I know for a fact, because I had one of them aimed at me, that um, some of these loggers are armed, and getting in their way is not always a really great idea. To add insult to injury, these forests, more than 90% of this biosphere reserve is a Hito land, meaning that it's owned by the indigenous people. It is their wealth. When these logs are harvested and carried out in smaller trucks, they're dumped unceremoniously right into the local communities, waiting for larger trucks to pick them up and haul them off. These logs, I suspect, um, are going to go into box making or maybe even to paper making. There's a Kimberly Clark. Uh, paper production uh, right near the area. Um, I'm not sure how able they are to screen the trees that come in. Um, but this really is an insult to the local communities. And as you can see in the background, um, their subsistence farming and, and, and harvest of wood for fires um, is also doing a great job of denuding these forests. Uh, in an attempt to accommodate the local communities, the government has made it legal for them to take dead wood out of the forests. Unfortunately, what that means is that oftentimes they'll go into these forests and girdle the trees. To Hello. Them. And then when the trees have been girdled, um, they will chop them up into small pieces and they're carried out for fuel wood. It's like a hive of working ants. There's thousands of trees taken out on horseback, on burros, children, moms, dads, everybody contributing to help their community to cook, eat, and stay warm um, by harvesting fuel from the forest. This at the same time 
doing huge damage to the butterflies and the other species. This is one of the things that makes the monarch butterfly so very important to our discussions is the fact that it is an indicator species. It's This forest houses a lot of other wildlife, but the challenges we see with the monarch butterflies tells us about the problem in those forests. Now, the cooking done by the indigenous people is extremely inefficient. This is a three stone fire, and I'm gonna describe it a little bit, but here's an interesting fact. On a planet of nearly 8 billion people, there are still more than 3 billion people that are cooking over a three stone fire. Why a three stone fire? Well, four stones is too many. Two stones is not enough. Three stones allows you to balance your pot over the fire. This is incredibly inefficient. Tremendous amount of fuel is wasted. And worse yet, many of these fires, in fact, most of these fires are inside of people's homes. And these fires, the smoke from these fires is the leading cause of deaths in human beings in the world. If you take can uh, breast cancer, malaria, deaths due to drink, dirty drinking water and AIDS, add them all together and still more people are killed by the effects of indoor cooking smoke than any other phenomena. These open fires fill their houses with smoke for mom and the kids who are the ones inside in the course of the day. According to the World Health Organization, this is the equivalent of smoking roughly 400 cigarettes a day. <clears throat> This is what mama's house is like without a proper stove. And this is what can be done in just a couple of hours to change it. This is a Patsadi stove. You see the ceiling of this house, so I want to point that out. Prior to this Patsadi stove going in and the air being cleaned in this home, that ceiling shows you what they were breathing in and out every single day. You know that it would be really hard to smoke 400 cigarettes a day. But I challenge you to step into one of these homes where it's not every few breaths that you're getting smoke, where it's every single breath that is just laden with smoke. This is really horrific. Ecolife Conservation decided that the, the monarch butterfly forest was a conservation effort that they wanted to tackle. And I am really proud to tell you that we have built now over 11,500 stoves on the perimeters of the Monarch Butterfly Reserve. These stoves have been reviewed, checked, and, and reviewed completely by the gold standard out of Geneva, Switzerland. We are now accredited for carbon offsets because of these stoves. And the work that's been done to determine their efficacy is amazing. Um, our adoption rate is at 97% for over 11,000 stoves. They take essentially all of the smoke out of their homes. They reduce their wood cutting by more than 50%. And they offset more than three tons of carbon every single year. This is really important for a whole lot of reasons. It's important locally. And of course, it's important to you and I. Every automobile on the road in the United States and Europe averages about four and a half tons of emissions every year. So we can start to offset automobiles that are on our roads by putting these stoves in. But how is climate change affecting wildlife? Extinctions are driven by habitat loss, and today climate change is the leader in habitat loss. Monarch butterflies, when they are there in the winter in these forests, before they leave, there's no native milkweeds there for them to lay their eggs on. They have to survive that winter. They have to wait till spring solstice because they're traveling by daylight. They have to fly north several hundred miles until they find milkweed to lay their eggs on. What's happening is as it gets warmer and warmer every spring, we're seeing butterfly activity in the mountains going way up with copulations and chasing energy being burnt resulting in many, many more dead butterflies. I have to tell you just a bit of trivia here um, for those of us in my age range and for all of us to keep in mind. The monarch migration is amazing. I've only told you about one generation flying south into Mexico. It takes three generations to fly north. So that southerly migrating generation is known as the Methuselah generation and lives up to nine months. The next three generations fly north and live maybe six to eight weeks at the most. 
scientists asking the question of why one generation lives so long and the others don't, one of the answers is, is that the generation flying south is sexually senescent. They're not chasing girls. They're not laying eggs. There's not a lot of energy being expended. So if you want to live forever, you know what it is you need to give up. In any event, offsetting climate change and making changes is extremely important. The other thing that's personally important in that I was inspired by what I thought was the loss of my little boy in Madagascar is I also knew that these open fires were the source of horrific burns for children. Um, all of our stoves have to have cool sides so that they're safe for kids. They have to be permanent so that we can track them and so that they can have a chimney. They have to use at least 50% less fuel, which is saving hundreds of thousands of trees every year. And most importantly, they have to be culturally appropriate. The people of the communities have to want to use it. Era vocal yo y este ahí también nos dijeron que nos iban a traer este unas estufas este para que o sea les salía más barato regalarnos una estufa que este que pagar un tratamiento de cáncer nos va a evitar este muchas muchas enfermedad que ahora sí que pues con con el humo porque hace cuánto hace que llevamos a mi suegra a, a Valle y le dijeron que la llevamos y no podía respirar bien y le dijeron que era por causa de, de el, el, el humo que diario a diario este cocinando y haciendo tortillas de ella lo respiraba entonces por, por eso me siento contenta están contentos nosotros yo creo que nos vamos bien contentos. nos vamos también muy contentos Pero digamos, quién no va a estar contento si yo te le llevo y de comer para tortillas, para una comida chica, y todo, diario, diario, diario. Así que yo soy el que cocino todo porque ella, pues luego, no, este, no le ayuda a una mano. O de cualquier cosa que le diga, ya cuando el bebé ya me lo trae. <risa> ya no respiran tampoco tanto humo porque ya no sale tanto humo ya todo sale por el, por el tubo los trastes ya no gastamos en lavarlos cada rato <risa> esperemos que así como en Saidarna nosotros sigan ayudando a otra gente porque pues para evitar lo de la enfermedad de los pulmones con este humo pues yo de mi parte le doy las gracias a la asociación que, por el apoyo que, pues, que nos brindó y Ojalá que Diosito los siga socorriendo, les dé más llenas para que sigan apoyando a más gente necesitada como nosotros. It will take hundreds of groups and several governments to all work together to save this beautiful phenomena of the migrating monarch butterfly. Um, but we feel that we're in a very unique spot with Ecolife in Mexico, where we can contribute to the local communities and help protect the butterflies all at the same time, making conservation a win for people and a win for wildlife. And hopefully through our fuel efficient stove program and the concerted efforts of other groups working to save the monarch butterfly, they'll, there, they'll be there for us, for our children, and for our children's children in the future to come. I'm really glad that you could join me tonight. This is a very brief promo. Please, there's lots of ways you can help um, attend our events, donate to a program. We travel to see the monarch butterflies every springtime at the end of February. We have two rooms left on our trip. If there's someone out there who would like to join us on an expedition to Mexico to see the monarch butterflies, please go to Eco Life Conservation's website and you will find that there. And that brings me to the end of our presentation this evening. I'm going to end my show and stop sharing my screen. Um, stop sharing, there we go. Well, thank you very much, Bill, for that really great informative and inspiring talk.
And uh, what we would like to do right now is, as we promised in all our promotion for this uh, wonderful event, that you would be giving away three of your uh, new books and they're autographed by Bill, but you have to work for them, folks, okay? So here's how we're gonna do it. Um, we hope that you were paying attention and took notes during the presentation because Bill has uh, formulated three questions for you and he will be asking questions and the first person who can get the question correctly into the chat is the one who will win the book. So I will need you, of course, to contact me afterwards so I can get your uh, your address so I can mail them to you. So Bill, should we give this a try? See how we how we sure. do? We'll, we'll see how we do. I um, okay. tried to emphasize these points in my story, so hopefully you caught some of them. And here's so when, the book, by the way. I liked your idea of holding it up like this before. <laughs> the, on the yeah, wings it's called of the on condor. The Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's done in a bit of a memoir style, but um, it's called on the wings of the condor because it is only because of the profile that I was able to gain during the condor program that I was able to travel the world and get involved in so many other conservation efforts. So while it tells a bit about the condor in there, there's also quite a bit on monarch butterflies and other things and and a recipe for saving our world because I really think there's things we can do and that we should be on it. So your first question is how many tons of butterflies were in the forest when Fred Urquhart discovered the overwintering monarchs? Ooh, I saw the right answer fly by quick. So the, the correct answer, but wow. <laughs> so, so we have a see. lot of correct ones. We the have to scroll answer, down here. Yeah, you have to find the first one because um, it came in really quickly. It was 550 tons was the estimate. So that's uh, taking the weight of a mon the average weight of a monarch butterfly, the number of monarch butterflies and, and coming up with a weight. So the correct answer is 550 tons. And I think it is Sandy Short. Does uh, everybody else agree with that? Yes. Okay, Sandy. Congratulations. Okay. So okay, next question. the second the second question is what is one Im potentially important impact of climate change on the overwintering monarch butterflies? How will climate change have a negative impact on the overwintering monarch butterflies? quick <laughs> i think judy smith judith smith got in there first on that one okay she said what was her answer bill she was saying early mating um ah. so it's warming up sooner so the butterflies are becoming active and they're expending all of this energy of which at this point they have very little left of Okay, that's great. So you guys are doing a great job. Okay, one more. All right. Here's the last one. If you're um, planting milkweed in your yard for monarch butterflies, um, especially here in San Diego, why are you having a hard time getting butter? If you're planting native milkweeds, why are you having a hard time getting butterflies to show up in your garden? There we go. I just saw it go by. Um, I think I think it's Jerry Ingram that gave the first correct answer. The 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 well and well, it's not really correct. So let let's see what comes here. Hold on. Yeah, I think maybe. Um, and I'm going to let you decide, uh, Marion, so I don't get killed by anyone. Um, oh no! The, thank the, you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. The answer is is that tropical milkweed, our non-native tropical milkweed, has very high cardiac glycosides, so it's mm -hmm. pulling them away from your yard if you're only growing indigenous. So did I anybody use that term? 
We didn't have anybody use that term then. Ramona so you think it's Jerry? Hall Ramona Hallett did loss cardiac glycoside. Okay, and who was that, Meryl? Ramona Hallett. Yep, who's saying our locals okay. have low cardiac glycoside, so she's correct. So Ramona, you're the winner. Okay, that's great. Okay, so I will get in touch with you guys and get these books out to you. And I would like to uh, turn it over now back to Joe for Q and A. Hey, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, if you want a book, make sure that Marion has your email address so we can find out how to get <coughs> to you. Uh, Bill, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Really inspiring and a little disturbing in places, I suppose, from the the, the, the climate impacts, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> Phil and I, I think, are going to alternate some questions for a little bit, but we have a few anyway. Um, one of the things that struck me is that I think there are non-migrating monarch butterflies also as, a, as an, a, another group of these uh, wonderful beings, as well as the migrating ones. And <clears throat> one of the things that Puzzle, puzzles me, and I wonder what science knows and what you could tell us about. If you're migrating, or the, if the butterflies are migrating from Canada south to Mexico, and it takes multiple generations, uh, partway on the path, Current, a, a generation will die and the new generation will be born. How does the new generation know that it's headed south to Mexico to these trees and these mountains? I mean, what's the mechanism that, that drives the, the migration and gets, you know, why don't they go back north or, or, or someplace yeah. else? What do, what do we know about that? Well, we we associate it with day length and where the sun is in the sky, but there's clearly a genetic basis to this. When you have one generation that lives significantly longer and only flies south, three generations that only fly north and have these shorter lifespans. Science is um, really loose on a couple of things. Number one, we talk about four or five major populations of monarchs in the United States. There's the Western population, the Eastern population. Now, our Western population mostly migrates east-west, while the Eastern migration one is north and south. And then there are sedentary populations in between. What, and we know that while those are really clean scientific distinctions we're making, that in reality, some of those butterflies are mixing. And how this doesn't dilute behaviors um, we honestly really don't know. Um, but it, the the directionality of the migration, I'm sure, is linked to genetics and, and the position of the sun in the sky that's guiding them. Hmm. Fantastic. Thanks. Phil? I think with Phil was uh, moderating some of the questions from, from the audience. Um, I can fill in. I saw one float by, okay. um, there was a question about, isn't there, um, can't we provide a stove to them that doesn't use wood for fuel? And I think down the road, the answer to that ultimately will, will soon be yes. Um, right now, the answer is no. And the reason is this, almost every home that we build a stove in has a modern gas stove in it. And if you open the oven, it is a cabinet. And if you look at the top of it, it's a shelf because they don't like the flavors with it. They can't afford the gas. So, so be, between not liking how it cooks and not wanting to spend the money, they don't use them. So we, we have five criteria for our stoves, as I mentioned. The last one is so important that it has to be culturally appropriate. Our adoption rate is as high as it is because these stoves cook the way they like their food to be cooked. And I'm sure the younger generation, as these kids are not sick all the time and get to go to school more and begin to have better education and smaller families, we hope, and better lives, we think we will see an evolution, obviously, away from a wood stove. Um, but for now, that's what they want. And if you want to have an impact, that's what we have to provide them. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Elizabeth Colbert was wrote a wonderful book or scary book about the sixth extinction. And as I understand it, these monarchs, or at least some of them, are on the endangered species list. And <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the uh, things that harms them apparently is uh, neonicotinoids. Nicotinoids, the the, the same uh, chemicals that kill bees. And if we stop using uh, the, the the question, sort of a complex one in the sense that if we stop using these. Uh, fertilizers and, and so forth that help both the birds and the bees, are, are there uh, are there uh, things that we can do that would help multiple species at the same time? You know, that's, yes. that, that's sort of the, what I was trying to get to. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a very simplistic answer to a very complicated question. And your question is indeed complicated. You know, people often ask us, um, isn't it hard to get people to adopt a stove in Mexico? And if you can imagine, say, someone walking into your home that doesn't speak your language and that you don't know and telling you to cook differently, what a challenge that might be. But I found that the people in Mexico are more willing to adopt these stoves properly presented than our farmers in the United States with alternatives to the way that they do things. Um, we have, in a way, an antiquated farming community in that they're using tech, many techniques that are very old that they're very anchored to for the same reason these Mexican families are anchored to their way of cooking. And then we have put on top of that these very modern things uh, like these GMO plants that are pesticide resistant. Um, so there's a lot of complicated things going on there, but an agriculture is one of the leading contributors to climate change and by itself is a leading contributor to habitat loss. So any conservation group that's not working on agriculture, in my opinion, is not really working on conservation um, because it's a huge, huge issue for everything. But the truth is, is there are far more sustainable ways to grow our crops. We can grow more crops more sustainably with smaller footprints, but it will take a real dedication to get people to change. And I invite you again to visit Ecolife Conservation's website, look at our aquaponics. Aquaponics is not the fit all answer for everything. Um, it's amazing, however, for vegetable crops um, where we can grow them in 10% of the space with 10% of the water um, in about two thirds of the time. So things can be done better and we need to start doing that better. Every crop, like every community will have a different need. Um, but I, I think with focused attention, these things can be addressed and, and need to be. Great answer, thank you. Phil, do you? Yes, uh, I've got a two part uh, question. Uh, the first is, is the monarch butterfly at this moment considered endangered and in trouble? And uh, B, uh, is the general collapse of the insect populations worldwide, is that uh, tied into the habitat loss similar to this uh, situation with the butterflies? In other words, is habitat loss also responsible for the dramatic decrease of insects which in turn is responsible for the decrease in uh, birds throughout the world, which sort of seems like we're heading for a catastrophe. Thanks. Yeah, pleasure. Um, so first of all, the, uh, in the United States, Mexico and Canada, the best of my knowledge, the monarch butterfly is not listed as endangered. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, has listed the migratory population of the monarch butterfly as endangered. Unfortunately, that has no clout in terms of enforcement. In the United States, I wouldn't speak for Canada or Mexico, but in the United States under our Endangered Species Act, if we list the monarch butterfly, it absolutely requires that we take steps to protect the monarch butterfly. Um, and I, I honestly believe the monarch butterfly has been proposed for listing in the United States. It hasn't been denied listing, but it's been put off and put off. 
And I really believe that it has a lot to do with the government not being prepared to get into a battle with agriculture um, over how we improve things. As to the second part of your question, yes, this is a worldwide phenomenon that's going on. And I, I love being able to use the term loss of habitat because loss of habitat can define a place that's been scraped of any habitat. It can describe a place that's had its temperatures changed so it doesn't work as well. Um, so it's really any change that for a species that's dependent on some component of it, it has then lost its habitat. Um, so yes, this is a global problem. And I get frustrated with people, you know, especially I say on climate issues, and I know that this is a big deal for most of you as well. When you hear people in the US say, well, China's not gonna do anything, or well, this country's not gonna do anything. For Pete's sake, we're all gonna die if we don't do something. So um, let's start here and, and hope to lead the parade. And I, I would say the same thing on the use of pesticides on changing our agricultural practices. We have, if, not, if we're not there yet, we're close to 8 billion people on this planet. They all deserve to be fed. And with the technology we have today, they can all be fed very well. And last note on that, I just mentioned this huge number of people, and we all know, those of us in conservation, we know that the exponential growth of the human population is a huge issue. But by providing healthier situations for kids, giving them the opportunity to get better schooling, the one thing we know is that educated families with empowered women have smaller family sizes. Thanks. Thanks. I read an article that said that the Western population of the monarchs, at least in one season, went down 99.9%. I don't know if the article was being too extreme or not, but they said they went, they, they counted from 10 million down to 1,094 monarchs, you know, uh, from the 1980s to 2021. And the Eastern population has fallen 84%. But then I read somewhere else that this year, the population has gone up again. Um, so this is, this is a bit like politics. Um, you can watch it too closely. Um, you have to look at big picture. Insects um, have high reproductive rates and short life expectancies. And you can see a lot of year to year fluctuation. Um, but I urge you not to pay attention to year to year and look over the long term. When Sonny and I first went to see monarch butterflies now 33 years ago, and we compare that population 33 years ago to today, when we go in a very, very good year, we see 10% of the butterflies that were there 32 years ago. Now, these very low 10% numbers bounce up and down. We get excited when there's another 10 or 100 million listed, um, but th those are going up and down, but the overall trend is down. The Western population this year seems to be up in Pacific Grove. They're getting good counts in the trees. Whereas last year, like you say, the counts were down around a thousand individuals. Now I think they're in the tens of thousands this year. But again, that's not too surprising with an insect to see those bumps. And again, we watch for trends which have been continually downward. Thank you. So I have a comment here from the uh, chat from Ellen. And uh, Bill, she's asking if you can suggest a resource for further reading about alternative low footprint agricultural strategies. And she is a farmer. She's asking as a farmer. And she yeah. also wanted to thank you and that she agrees with you that we need to redesign our food production to also include natural ecosystem support. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's really funny. Um, I have to answer this with a very short story. Most of the people I think who get into wildlife conservation, like I've done, when they're very young, uh, they get into it because they want to pet animals. You know, I like holding snakes and having birds and breeding them, those kinds of things. And I think that has tainted our conservation process as we go forward. All of this to explain, to um, answer this question that I would have never imagined that today I was working on things like hydroponics and aquaponics as agricultural strategies, because I just really wanted to hug birds and gorillas. Uh, so I mean, in a sense, um, as a leader, I'm in a field I don't know a whole lot about, but my staff knows a ton about. Um, there are some great resources on Ecolife Conservation's website for vegetables. 
Um, I would have to do a little homework for you and be happy to, to find some on things like corn and, and other crops like that. Um, but for vegetable crops, I really urge people to take a close look at aquaponics. The numbers are very solid. Um, you know, California and Arizona um, produce more lettuce than any country in the world with the exception of China. And of course, lettuce requires a lot of water from two states that ran out of water over 100 years ago. And every year in heads of lettuce, we export billions of gallons of water. And we can reduce that by 90% with the technology that's available to us now. Oh, that's so cool. I want to pick up on a comment that was in Phil's question. Uh, it seems like in addition to the monarchs, insects around the world are uh, on the decline of, of, of many sorts, if not all. So the question is, what are the three most effective restorative actions we can take for the monarchs and in a broader sense for in, insects? Yeah, and the, so uh, this isn't as easy as I'm going to make it sound, but the, the first step is to stop screwing things up. <laughs> um, so I, I see a lot of people wanting to replant trees in Mexico for the forest habitat, and I'm entirely supportive of that. But bear in mind, it's going to take 30 to 50 years for those trees to reach such a size to be of any value to the monarch butterflies better that initially we protect the trees that are there and stop the mature ones from being cut down. Um, I would suggest planting things, for example, for monarchs in the perimeter that we can use as fuel wood at 10 years, at eight or 10 years, rather than trying to restore, you know, those buffer zones. Give up the buffer zones, let them be fuel wood zones if you need to be, and stop destroying new things, because restoring things is very, very hard. Um, I have gotten a rather tainted view of zoos. I spent 35 years of my life dedicated to and working in zoos. So I say this with some experience. And that is, is that the whole foundation of what zoos tell people today is that we're going to breed animals for release back to the wild. Well, increasingly, there's no wild to release them back to. And when we do release things back to the wild, it's very, very difficult and has very low success rates. So so yes, participate in restorative activities, absolutely. Um, but first and foremost, stop tearing things down. Fantastic, thanks. Phil? Phil, you're muted. So sorry, School for the Gifted. Um, <laughs> Yeah, back to the agriculture. Um, is this uh, use of agricultural chemicals, is it specific to the uh, industrialized nations or have you seen it spread uh, to the uh, third world countries also? It, it is it is spread. So in, in, let's um, give a fair tip to agriculture. If you look at the use of pesticides in the US, a lot of the, the biggest damage done is by backyard gardeners. <laughs> who are overusing and misusing and that sort of thing. The one thing I will say for commercial farming is it's, the word commercial is very important. And so I think have, we can have a profound impact there because they're so huge, yes. But, but as we look at smaller farmers, I mean, you know, the use of things like DDT and that sort of thing is still going on all over the world. And in, in developing countries where there's less regulations, it's just a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this is not just a first world problem, and it's not just a commercial agriculture pro problem. For each and every one of us, look at what's in your your shed and what you're using in your yard, and for the most part, stop it. <laughs> right. Wow. I have run out. Marion or Phil, do you have other questions? I've got a couple of questions that Kate just okay. came up in the chat, and they're actually related to each other. So if you guys don't mind, I'll jump in. Please. Um, I'm going to ask the one that was uh, posted most recently because it seems to uh, um, be a good one to introduce before this. The other question that was raised about 15 minutes ago, Carolyn 
Shadow asked, what advice do you have for those who want to raise monarchs? And earlier, Gurov Soman asked, with a lot of people planting milkweeds artificially and raising, releasing monarchs, will it alter the migration patterns of these butterflies in the long run? Yeah, th this is complicated questions with um, mixed data, but um, I'm going to stay on the safe biological side of that. And that is, do not bring monarch butterflies into your house or into enclosures to raise plant native milkweeds to, to raise them on, let it happen in your yard. I'm a member of many monarch groups on social media and I hear all these people dragging in hundreds of caterpillars and raising them. Nature has a system and we should let it work. Um, we can try planting milkweed to replace the milkweed that's lost. So that's a good thing to do. Um, but beyond that, be an observer. Don't try to alter nature. Um, I encourage you to plant native milkweeds. And as I mentioned, that can be very frustrating because if your neighbor or somebody another block over has tropical milkweed, all your butterflies are gonna go over there. Now I'll probably get pushed back on this, but this is what we do at home is we'll plant 10 or 15 native milkweeds and one or two tropical milkweed. The butterflies come to the tropical milkweed. And for those of you who keep butterflies at home, you know very quickly they'll mow it down and eat all the leaves off of it. The caterpillars will then leave and go to the native milkweeds and continue to feed. So that works out very well. Then what you have to do is come early fall, and I'm, I'm early on it, like September, um, cut your tropical milkweed to the ground, keep it cut to the ground until springtime. And that way you have the benefit of having butterflies in your yard, native milkweeds in your yard and are hopefully doing a little less damage. But do not hand raise butterflies. Don't try to save butterflies. Be an observer. It's a fascinating process and a miracle to watch. I'd like to build on that a little bit, if you may, if I may, Bill. Um, we have two and a half acres up here in Valley Center, and what we're trying to do is actually rewild as much of the yard as we can. So we have the uh, native milkweed, but we also have other plants surrounding it too to try to kind of encourage a whole ecosystem going. Like our milkweed is right next to a beautiful sage, and uh, I've noticed that it's been just really rewarding and amazing to see um, the birds and the insects populate and. Um, uh, so that was my comment. My question is, is does uh, Ecolife still do the wonderful tours that you used to do of your uh, um, aquaponics program or has that stopped? So, so first, thank you for your comment because nature is diverse. You want your backyard to be diverse. Um, you know, so, so share, so you're exactly right, Mary, and this isn't about planting just milkweed, mm -hmm. plant milkweed because the, what it's really providing is food for larva. So you still need nectar plants for your butterflies. You still need cover for them and that sort of thing. So during COVID, Ecolife quit doing tours of their farm, but we invested that time in really making some wonderful changes up there. And you can again do tours at the Ecolife farm, which is in Northern Escondido off to your Springs Road. And I would really encourage you to do it. Um, after Thanksgiving would be a good time. The, the right, right now things are very busy. Um, but if you, you tune in after Thanksgiving and get hold of us, um, we'd be happy to arrange a tour up there. It's really neat to see the farm and its productivity and what's going on. We've also designed very quickly, I, I know we're short on time probably, but we've designed a system that we call the Mark I, uh, the Mobile Aquaponic Response Kit. The idea being that with a cargo container, we can drop a farm into a community that is solar operated rainwater harvesting and can feed two to 300 people out of it with stuff that we can stuff into a 20 foot cargo container and set up for them. So, and it allows you to farm where the soil is awful. Um, you don't need to have level ground or good dirt or anything like that. Don't worry about it, we can fix that. Okay, I've got a quick good. question for you, if I may. Um, yep. Is there a corollary? raised too, so. Um, I think Susan Sherrod has a hand up, but yeah, go ahead, oh, Phil. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was wondering, is there a corollary to this butterfly in uh, other continents in Africa or in Asia? Well, 
So the, the, that's a, a complicated question. There are similar ones. Now, of course, the monarch butterfly has been introduced um, around the world. There are populations in New Zealand and Australia, Africa, that sort of thing. So you, you can now see them. So this really isn't so much about maybe a species right now going extinct so much as this, it is about this migratory phenomena. In terms of migration, there's a lot of debate about that. As an ornithologist, um, my definition of migration is an annual round trip made by a single individual. Now, this remarkable migration of the monarch butterfly at about four generations is an annual round trip. And I think it's just so phenomenal that it deserves to be called a migration. Um, I don't think there's any other butterfly that does that style of a round trip migration every year. We will here on the West Coast, for example, see painted ladies come in from the, the deserts um, after some rains and things like that. But that's a temporary range expansion and not so much a migration. And most of those butterflies that we see come through here end up dying. I see. I just had a quick question. Um, in San Diego area, we have had these mature eucalyptus trees that are being said, oh, they're not native. I went to an exhibit at Balboa Park at a contemporary art museum that said these eucalyptus are actually used by monarchs when they're migrated. And I wondered, is that true? It, it is true. And it, it this is another real mystery of the monarch butterfly. Uh, so for example, if you were to go up to Pacific Grove right now, where the monarch butter, the Western population, a lot of the Western population is overwintering, they are in eucalyptus trees. And eucalyptus trees are introduced. They're a huge pest. They take a lot of water away and they outcompete our native plants. Why monarch butterflies have gone to them when they were never there before, and when they are so strict about going to OML fir trees in Mexico, is just one of the many mysteries that teases us into remaining monarch butterfly biologists. Um, so I, my solution to that is that it's not all eucalyptus that they're using. Uh, butterflies, when they overwinter, go back to specific places. So my pitch would be that if monarch say the, the eucalyptus trees of Pacific Grove, go ahead and protect them. Uh, the eucalyptus trees of Escondido that don't have any monarchs in them, I say get those turkeys out of here. <laughs> you know, so I, I think we have to be reasonable about what we do. Um, but um, most eucalyptus are not used by them. But strangely enough, if they're going to use a tree, it's most likely going to be a eucalyptus with the Western population. Thank so, you. Bill, I was I was uh, going through the uh, participants, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but this is an international audience. You have uh, people here from Canada, and also somebody is here from India. I don't know if they're still here. And so, I had a kind of a silly question: Are there monarch butterflies in India? Gosh, I, that I don't know. I'd certainly okay. say it's possible. Milkweed, um, as as you may know is um, one of these plants that is a first colonizer in disturbed habitats. So if it's an area that has disturbed habitats and has a milkweed plant and someone brought monarchs there, they could certainly be there. That's how they've gotten established in New Zealand and Africa. And so um, it definitely wouldn't surprise me. And yes, I saw that Don Davis is here from Canada. I'm, I'm really thrilled that he joined us. Um, somebody I have a huge amount of respect for. Oh, that's great. And um, one last thing, I think it would be a great idea for the North County Climate Change Alliance <clears throat> to arrange a field trip to that aquaponics uh, thing. So I'll be getting in touch um, about that. And I also want to thank you again so much and thank everybody here for uh, you know, hanging in there with us through a little technical, a few little technical glitches in the beginning. <clears throat> but um, we would like to close up this evening and uh, we have a tradition here, Bill, of gifting our speakers with something and what we do is we purchase a tree in your honor that will be planted in an area here in california that has been um, sadly burned by by wildfires so again thank you very very much and also too don't forget that you could buy bill's book if you weren't lucky enough to win one uh through amazon and also i believe the eco life um website has a link to where you can purchase it too. So with that, we are going to say, unless anybody has, Bill, do you have any last words, like a call to action or anything you would you like know, to sum up? 
do something. <laughs> I get there's my call to action. Um, you know, one of yeah. our stuff costs one hundred and fifty dollars. Planting a tree is very inexpensive. We can all do something small, and if we all did something small, it would end up being huge. Um, so I encourage you to do everything you can because I, I really believe we're past at a point where we can trust or bank on our governments. I've talked about the disaster in Madagascar. Nobody there waited for the government to come save them because it doesn't happen. And I'm not sure yeah. it's going to happen on climate. And it's up to each of us to step forward and do something. And thank you also for promoting the book. It is on Ecolife's site. It's on yours great and on Amazon.com. And I, it, it has some of my suggestions for how we make things better. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you to our wonderful audience, too. So good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Very cool. Bye.